Hi, everyone, and welcome to International Dark Sky Week 2023 with the International Dark Sky Association. My name is Betty Meyerfoot. I am IDA's Director of Engagement. So excited to be here with you all today for our Friday night No Lights event. We have Samyukta Mani Kumar, who is on IDA's board of directors, also a leader of our Dark Sky Kenya chapter. And she runs her own nonprofit dedicated to protecting the night sky in Slovenia and beyond called the Notika Institute. So please check that out. She will start with a tour of the Southern Hemisphere night skies, which I'm super excited to see. She will be followed by Kelly Beattie, who used to be on IDA's board of directors. He's a great IDA supporter, dark sky supporter, and works with Sky and Telescope. He also has a podcast about what you can see in the night sky every month. So feel free to learn more about Kelly and Samyutka after this event. Please pop in the chat with a hello and where you are calling in from and how you are celebrating Dark Sky Week. Uh, I was out at Saguaro National Park last night for an incredible star party and it was so nice to see the night sky and to see celebration of our beautiful dark skies here in and around Tucson, Arizona, which is the home of IDA. And I recently learned Tucson, Arizona was the first place in the world to ever enact an actual lighting ordinance. So really cool to see how that's actually helping people here and you can still see the Milky Way in the night sky, only a few minutes from downtown. So welcome everybody. Um, Chung, this is this is a star tour using Stellarium. So some of you and Kelly have recorded these for us. And I'll go ahead and get these started now. Let's see. Uh, here we go. Should I tap on you? kind of lonely here today. Michael is on his way to the Great Sand Dunes to give a presentation about Dark Sky Week over there in Colorado. So thank you all for keeping me company here. And we will go ahead and get started. Please let me know if the audio is not working. Hello, everyone. Happy International Dark Sky Week. And thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, today I'm going to do a short tour of the different things you can see from the southern hemisphere. And I also wanted to include the equator because I didn't want to leave my equator people out. I was born in Nairobi on the equator and it's nice to know that you can see both halves of the sky and we don't really hear about the southern sky that much. So this is just going to be a short run through of a few interesting things to look for in the night sky. This is for tonight, but the sky should look pretty similar over the next couple of days. So if you don't get a chance to go out tonight, maybe try over the weekend or early next week and you might be able to spot some of these things. So I'm gonna be showing you some constellations and some interesting objects that you can find in them. And I also wanted to include some cultural stories and perspectives that I thought were interesting. Some of these, uh, objects that I'll show you can be seen from light polluted areas as well and some of them need slightly darker skies so I'm going to try and include a nice mix so that there is something for everyone. I'm starting at a latitude of about 33 degrees south of the equator but I'm going to show you what the sky will also look like or what these objects look like a lot lower and a lot higher than this latitude. We'll start at around sunset, right after sunset, where you'll find the easiest constellation to spot in the whole sky, which is Orion. Orion is this group of, of stars. Uh, it's usually joined up like this to make a man with a bow and arrow and a belt and a sword and in the southern hemisphere, he is upside down. So his head is lower than the rest of his body. 
Um, but Orion is really easy constellation to find, and it's full of really cool objects. Um, so it has these two bright stars, um, Rigel, I think that's how you pronounce it, and Betelgeuse. Rigel is a young blue star, and Betelgeuse is an old red star that is actually expected to go supernova sometime soon, but it's a very loose soon. Um, I think it's probably within, like, between any time now and the next couple of thousand years or something. So Orion's belt, this group of three stars, and his sword actually features in Mayan ethnoastronomy. So the Mayans looked at this arrangement and they saw his belt as three stones. Um, these three stars in his belt as three stones. And this portion of the constellation, his sword, where the Orion Nebula is, as the fire that was lit at the moment of creation. The Orion Nebula is really cool to look at, if, especially if you have binoculars or a telescope. I think you have to be in a really dark place to see it with your naked eye. I've never seen it without equipment, but maybe some of you have, or maybe some of you will tonight or this weekend. Um, but this nebula is basically a region where stars are formed. It's a collection of hot dust and gas, and it's really beautiful to look at. So I would recommend checking this out. Also because it's really easy to find. I'm going to change location to close to the equator now. And you can still see Orion off the sunset. I'm just going to go back in time a little bit to get you to right off the sunset. Yeah, you can still see Orion, but you will notice that he's kind of rotated so that now he's more horizontal. Um, and this will happen the more north you go in latitude, the more he will rotate until he's fully upright, or at least almost fully upright. But Orion will still be visible if you're looking from the equator, just look after sunset and look directly above the western horizon. If you're on the equator or close to the equator, maybe between five degrees north and five degrees south of the equator. And if you go further south, you can see Orion again. Um, but here he's fully rotated. Um, he's almost completely upside down. And the lower you go, the more he will rotate until you're at the South Pole. But uh, you can still see the same stars, the same fire of creation that the Mayans saw. And I think that's pretty cool. Okay, I'm going to go back to a uh, latitude of about 33 degrees in Cape Town in South Africa. And from here, after sunset, if you look to the right of Orion, you'll see Mars, hopefully, which is going to appear as a red, a reddish kind of steady light. Usually the stars tend to twinkle, but lights from the planets doesn't twinkle that much. And that makes it pretty easy to distinguish a planet from a star. And if you look to the right of Mars, you'll see these two stars, Castor and Pollux. So these two stars, they're part of the constellation of Gemini. And these two are supposedly the twins of Gemini. The Mayans actually had a very functional use for these two stars. They used Castor and Pollux at the beginning of the dry season to track time. So depending on where they saw these two stars in the sky, they would be able to tell what time it was. On the equator, you, you will have to look a bit higher up to find Castor, Pollux, and Mars, as well as Orion. So if you know where Betelgeuse is, you can just find the closest red thing on the right that's not twinkling. And then you should be able to see these two stars pretty straightforwardly. And maybe you can even try and look for the whole constellation of Gemini. But if you don't find the whole constellation, then I think just looking at these two is enough. And if we go further south, you won't be able to see Gemini. Um, the two stars will be 
visible right on the horizon just for sunset. So um, you might not be able to see them that well as time goes on because there's usually a lot of haze on the horizon and on Stellarium there's a tree here now, but yeah, I, you can try. It's worth trying just to find them. Um, but if not, then you'll see them at a different time in the year. Back to Cape Town at 33 degrees south. One southern constellation that you can't really see from the northern hemisphere is Centaurus. So if you turn to face the south, roughly south, southeast, somewhere here, you should be able to see the constellation Centaurus. It's really big. Um, it spans a really large area of sky. So if you're at about maybe 30 degrees south of the equator, you would look right above southeast and try to identify this shape. I would try to use uh, one of the phone simulation apps to help you find it. The whole constellation should be visible from even light polluted areas. But if you're in a dark place, I would recommend that you try to look for Omega Centauri, which is this, not that, this object here. So this object, Omega Centauri, is a globular cluster. So it's one of the older clusters in our galaxy and it contains about a thousand stars that's loosely bound together and this particular cluster is one of the few that's visible to the naked eye in dark enough conditions so if you can go somewhere dark enough to look for it then you should i haven't seen it i'm looking forward to looking for it at some point if you're in a light polluted area i would recommend that you try to see it with binoculars or a telescope and you can see it from both the equator and the southern hemisphere. So just connect these two stars in the constellation with a line and try to look about like three eighths way up the line for a kind of fuzzy blob. It will be close to the band of the Milky Way here. So if you're in a dark place, you will see some kind of dust and a bit of hazy, cloudy looking uh, stuff around here. If you're on the equator, face southeast, and you'll be able to see um, this uh, constellation rising from the southeast. So it will be roughly here around sunset, and then it will gradually rise as the night goes on. So you'll have a better chance of spotting this a bit later at night when it's a little bit above the horizon and it's not so obscured by this haze that you have around the horizon. If you're lower down in the southern hemisphere, this is now 53 degrees below the equator. You'll still be able to see Centaurus um, above the southeastern horizon. And you're in luck because from where you are, it will never set. So you'll be able to see it through the whole night. So it will stay up until sunrise here. So close to Centaurus is another small constellation that's probably much easier to find. It's called Crux or the Southern Cross. It's this constellation over here, which is a cross made of four stars, as you can see. And um, this is what it looks like in the night sky without the lines to guide you. You'll find it also in this kind of dust band of the Milky Way. And this is one of the constellations that people use to find the direction of south. Crux is a nice, easy constellation to tick off your list, but it's also quite hard to find a group of four stars and not confuse it for a different group of four stars. There's another group of four stars close by up here that looks very similar. And um, you can see that it forms almost the same pattern. And this one is called the false cross. When you're looking for the southern cross, just try not to get fooled by this similar group of stars up here. Just uh, remember that it's the closest one to Centaurus and try to use a sky map application to guide you if you're trying to look for it. Crux is also visible from the equator and from further south you can see it higher in the sky and on the equator it's lower in the sky. Crux 
contains a very special object. It's a special kind of nebula, which is called a dark nebula, because instead of emitting light that we can see, like any other nebula, this particular kind of nebula blocks light. So this nebula lives in crux. I'm going to try and find it. Um, you can't really see it on Stellarium. Um, it's a bit hard to see, but in person, it's apparently much more vivid if you have a dark enough sky. So you do need really dark skies for this. You have to be able to see the dust in the Milky Way, and then you will make out this portion of the Milky Way where the dust isn't visible. I'm just going to show you a picture of what this nebula looks like. But the Australian Aboriginal cultural groups of Gamilaroi and Uwaliai, I hope I'm saying that right, they had a myth about this nebula. It's called the Colsac Nebula. We call our galaxy the Milky Way. They called it the spirit emu in the sky. And they believed that the head of this emu was this dark nebula, the Colsac Nebula and that its body stretched out through all this dust in the Milky Way. So in April, around now, they see this emu with legs, like going all the way up into the night. And they see the emu chasing the male emus. And over the months, the legs of this emu become invisible and the head stays up. And at that time, the emu is said to be nesting. So another thing about Crux, Crux is actually one of the globe at night constellations for April. So if you go onto the globe at night website, you can log your observations of the stars in Crux if you can see it. So if you're on the equator of the Southern Hemisphere, uh, go outside, try to look for Crux, try to count the stars. They'll give you instructions on the website and you can submit an observation to contribute to measurements of light pollution from wherever you are. And every bit of data counts, so I encourage you to go do that as soon as you can. Now I'm going to move on to two other special objects in the southern sky, which are the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. So the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds are these two fuzzy objects that you will see if you're sort of moderately low uh, below the equator at about 30 degrees, you will see them between the south and the southwest. These are satellite galaxies of our galaxy, the Milky Way. So they orbit our galaxy the same way the moon orbits the Earth, but obviously over a much, much larger time scale. And these two galaxies are dwarf galaxies, which explains why they look so tiny compared to, oops, compared to our massive fuzzy blob. So the large Magellanic cloud is larger and the small one is smaller. These usually need dark skies. You may be able to spot them maybe from a slightly light polluted city. I think if you have very much light pollution where you are, you won't see them. From the equator, these are really hard to see. You won't see the small Magellanic cloud. It's already set by the time the sun sets. So you won't be able to see it in the sky. And you might catch the large one if you have an area with very unobstructed horizon and no lights coming from the horizon area. And if you're much further south, this is, again, from the lowest points in uh, South America at minus 53 degrees below the equator. You will be able to see both of them between south and southwest. So just look kind of almost overhead and you'll see like a large smudge and a smaller smudge. And for you, these won't set. They'll be up all night. And the two Australian Aboriginal groups that I mentioned earlier, they had some stories about these two galaxies. They thought that the small Magellanic cloud he was an Aboriginal doctor, and he was the one who determined whether a dead person could or couldn't go to heaven. So if someone hadn't been initiated on Earth and they died, he would send them to the Large Magellanic Cloud, she would send them back to Earth as a baby. The Large Magellanic Cloud, they believed, was a woman who would sing babies into women on Earth. So they believed that she was responsible for women producing babies, which is really beautiful, I think. And that's pretty much the end of the objects that I had to show you. There's one more thing, a special thing that's happening tomorrow night, the 22nd which is the Lyrids meteor shower. The Lyrids are one of the oldest recorded meteor showers, and 
they can be really prolific. Sometimes you can see up to 100 meteors an hour. From the southern hemisphere, you will be able to see them really late at night, maybe around 1 or 2 in the morning. But it will be a really dark night. The moon sets really early. It sets close to around when the sun sets. So you will have a really good chance of catching at least a few meteors. So if you're on the southern hemisphere, you will have to stay up or wake up early in the morning and go outside and try and look for some. But if you're on the equator, you will again see them rising roughly northeast and they'll rise around 11 p.m. and they'll be visible until sunrise. So if you get a chance to go see them or photograph them, I would recommend that you do. If you're in the south, uh, it's still worth a try. They're one of the few meteor showers that's visible in both hemispheres. That's it for my, my little tour. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you feel inspired to go outside and try to find some of these things for yourself or maybe different things. Um, I'd love to hear if you have any thoughts or questions or if I made any mistakes, please correct me. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you to the IDA for giving me this opportunity to do this tour. Hello everyone and welcome to this recorded night sky tour. I'm Kelly Beatty. I've been a long time volunteer for the International Dark Sky Association. And I want to welcome you to International Dark Sky Week, a celebration of all the stuff that we can see above at night. And what I'd like to do is give you a little tutorial on what you can see when you go outside. You know, I live and breathe stars. I've been working at Sky and Telescope magazine, an astronomy magazine for close to 50 years now. And uh, I, just, I just love telling people about what's up. Maybe you are not so familiar with what's up in the sky. And so my job is to give you a little introduction to that. We're gonna start with what you see here, which is a uh, portrayal of the nighttime sky uh, for roughly about an hour after sunset for wherever you happen to be. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that we have different time zones across the country and around the world but those time zones are based on where the sun is in the sky. And so, you know, 7 p.m. for me in Boston, uh, 19 hours, uh, is, is the same as 7 p.m. in Japan or in Germany. And so you're, we're all gonna see about the same stars in the Northern Hemisphere that you're seeing here on your screen. So you can see the compass points there and some of the brightest stars are labeled. But what I wanna call your attention to first is the fact that not all stars in the sky are the same brightness. And in fact, if they were all the same brightness, it would be a pretty boring sky. We'd have just a sky full of polka dots instead of the depth and, and uh, uh, you know, varying intensity that we see. And it's also true that the more light pollution you have in your sky, the more stars uh, are, are, are blotted out by that and the fewer that you'll actually see. On an exquisitely dark night, completely far away from city lights with no moon in the sky, you can see a couple of thousand stars. I've never stopped to count them actually, but, but that's, that's the case. And as light pollution gets stronger and stronger, it robs us of the faintest stars first and only leaves the very brightest ones in the sky. So what I'm showing you is sort of a medium sky, much like I would have here in my home in Massachusetts, where you know a lot of stars are visible, but certainly not as many as if I were deep, deep, deep in the dark. And you notice that some stars are brighter and some are fainter, and there are two reasons for that. I often ask this of my uh, star party audiences. If see, I'll give you a second to see if you can think of it. Okay, two reasons. The first is that some stars are closer than others, and some some are farther away. We measure those distances usually in light years. The closest stars to our solar system, to Earth, are about four light years away. That means the light has been traveling at the speed of light for four years to reach us. Uh, and then some stars are brighter than others because they're just intrinsically brighter. It's the nature of stars that uh, some stars burn much hotter and brighter uh, than others. And so those stars will appear brightest to us in the sky. So those two things combine. What we're seeing here now is a sort of what I would call uh, for here in the Northern Hemisphere, a late winter sky. The, the bright stars of winter led by Orion the Hunter are gradually disappearing into the West and uh, the stars of spring are rising up in the East. Stars rise in the East and set in the West just like the sun does because the earth is turning. And so over the, I wanna tell you that there are 
that stars not only have different brightnesses, but they also move. And they move in two ways during, during, uh, uh, during the course of the night and during the course of a year. Let's start with during the course of the night. I'm gonna call up my little time slug here and you can see that, that I've set it uh, for about, so it's about 7.36 here. It's roughly an hour after sunset where I'm at. And I want you to, I want to call your attention here to this constellation, which is Orion. I'm going to zoom in on Orion a little bit so we can see it. And we'll, we'll add a little bit of, uh, of, of, of figures to him. So here's Orion the hunter. And uh, Orion is, uh, Orion is very common in the winter sky. And in fact, the data I have here is for March 15th. And, and I'll show you what's going on here in, in just a minute. Over the course of an hour, as the Earth turns, Orion is going to move farther and farther over to the west. And you can see that as I click through here one hour at a time, you can see that Orion is moving farther and farther to the west. So that's one way that stars move through the sky. And then the other is because the Earth is going around the sun, the sun's position, well, the sun-Earth geometry changes and the sun's position with respect to the background stars changes as well. So I, I kind of mistakenly started off here with March 15th. I'm going to jump ahead to April 15th and watch what happens to Orion. Bang, he goes way over toward the west. Even though the time has not changed, Orion's position in the sky from week to week at the same time, and this applies to all the stars too, will change as well. So here we have the, the I'm going to kind of zoom in here on the western horizon because there's a couple of interesting things going on here that that you need to be alert to right after it starts to get dark. I want you to think about going outside, oh, roughly 45 minutes after the sun goes down. And this is kind of the sky that you will see. The, you, there are actually, there's two and actually three planets in view. Venus right here over in the west, over where the sun sets is unmistakable. But lurking to the lower right of Venus, down here near the horizon is the planet Mercury. Now, both Venus and Mercury are closer to the sun than the Earth is. And so, as we see it, they're never all that far from the sun in the sky. Mercury is especially challenging to spot. And right now, in this period of time, through, say, the third week of April, um, Mercury is making its best evening appearance for the whole year. And so, if you've always wanted to see where Mercury is in the sky, if you've always wanted to spot it, Go out about 45 minutes after sunset, look to the west, you'll see Venus very obviously, and then look to the lower right of, of Venus, very close to the horizon, and you'll see a bright star all by itself right there where the cursor is. That is Mercury. And night by night, Mercury will rise up a little higher at the same time and then sink down because it's moving around the sun in just 88 days. That's all it takes to circle the sun. It's a very fast moving planet, which is why the ancients named it for their fleet messenger, Mercury. Okay, so there's Venus, there's Mercury, and then to the upper left of Venus is Mars. And we use, uh, let me just show you a quick little, little uh, scheme here. I'm gonna measure the distance that you can see here between Venus and Mars. It's about 35 degrees. That's how astronomers measure distances in the sky with degrees. And so you can measure that, you can actually measure that yourself using your fist, believe it or not. You clench your fist and you hold it out at arm's length and that the, the width of your fist is about 10 degrees. So I would tell people, look about three and a half or four fists to the upper left of Venus and you'll spot Mars. Mars is the red planet. It was much, much brighter a few months ago. It's kind of on the tail end of its evening show for us, but it's still there. And if you look carefully at Mars, you can tell that it's a little bit not white. It has a ruddy color, kind of like ginger ale. And Mars is called the red planet because its surface rocks have a little bit of rust on them. Its rocks are rusty, and that's what gives Mars its characteristic color. All right, so here is uh, Orion setting in the west. Orion has some very distinctive stars in his belt. These three stars uh, are called, uh, they're collectively called the Belt of Orion. You can see this figure has a kind of hourglass shaped torso 
in mythology, uh, Orion is uh, has this out in front of him. Let me turn on a few little characters here so you can see. He's actually carrying the head of, uh, of something that he's uh, killed. Uh, and in his right hand, he's, or left hand, whichever, uh, he's, he's raised up with a, with a club over his head. So these three stars mark the belt of Orion. And, uh, and up at the shoulder of Orion is the star Betelgeuse. Some people say Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is a little closer to the original. And then down at the, the, the knee or the foot of Orion is Rigel. Now you'll see that Rigel and Betelgeuse are roughly the same brightness in the sky. And yet they are very different. If you look carefully, you can tell that Betelgeuse is a warmer color than Rigel is. And that's because Betelgeuse has a surface that is not as hot. It's counterintuitive. We think of red as being hot and blue as being cold. But when it comes to stars, it's just the opposite. Stars that are hotter are actually bluer, just like the flame from a gas grill or a gas stove is blue and much hotter than the yellowish flame from a candle. So see if you can tell the difference between those two stars, their color in the sky. Now off to the right, uh, to the left of the belt by a couple of fists is this star, which is also very unmistakable like Venus. It's very, very bright. Uh, and that is Sirius. Sirius is the brightest star in the nighttime sky. Uh, uh, it, is, it is by far brighter than other stars. And so what you see here is a little cluster of constellations uh, with Orion the Hunter, I'll turn the figures back on. Orion the Hunter is here. Sirius is part of the larger dog, uh, uh, Canis Major. And up here is, a, is another bright star named Procyon, which is the anchor star in a very small constellation, the smaller dog, Canis Minor. Now, in this portrayal, uh, the little dog is sitting on the back of what looks to be a unicorn. And in fact, it is a unicorn. This is the constellation. Monoceros, a very hard to find constellation because when I take it away, you can see that all the stars in Monoceros are very faint. And so you're not going to be able to see the shape of a unicorn here. You'll just have to take my word for it. But it's about halfway between Sirius and Procyon. Okay, let's back out a little bit here. There are a couple more stars that I want to show you in this evening part of the sky. One is just to the right of the belt, if you follow, not just a little bit before you get to Venus, is this star, which is Aldebaran. There you can see the name of it, Aldebaran. Aldebaran means, in ancient Arabic, it means the follower. And what is Aldebaran following? Well, it's following this little patch of sky right here to the lower, left of, uh, lower right of Venus by just a little bit called the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. It's a cluster of stars. Now, the Pleiades are usually a lot easier to see earlier in the year when they're higher up in the sky. Right now, they're close to the horizon. So if you want to see them, you have to go out very soon after it gets dark and look. just look to the lower right of Venus. The, the Pleiades looks really terrific uh, uh, through a pair of binoculars. Now, I'm going to zoom in on them a little bit. The Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, are named for the daughters of Atlas. Atlas is the god who was uh, uh, condemned to carry the universe on his shoulders. And these are his seven daughters. And so in mythology, the seven sisters are, uh, there are many tales associated with them. Uh, one of them is they're constantly being chased by Orion. And uh, Aldebaran over here is, is a follower of, of uh, the, the Pleiades in the sky. Now, this is a cluster of stars that astronomers call an open cluster. That is to say, these stars all form together at the same time, roughly 100 million years ago, from the same cloud, big, huge cloud of gas and dust out in space, out in interstellar space. They all formed, they all hatched uh, from that one cloud, and so they all have about the same age. Now, although they appear close together in the sky, and they are close together in space, they won't stay that way forever. There's not enough mass collectively among them to hold the, the, all of the stars together. And so eventually the stars of the Pleiades are going to drift apart and become mingled with the rest of the stars in the Milky Way, and, uh, and you, it will cease to be a cluster. I bring this to your attention because astronomers think that this is exactly how our sun forms four and a half billion years ago. 
as part of a cluster, much like the Pleiades. And in those four and a half billion years, all of the siblings of the sun have drifted away and gotten mixed up with the Milky Way. We have no idea what other stars might have been born with the sun. There's certainly no, none close to us right now. All right, so we're going to back up. I'm going to I'm going to leave this western part of the sky, and of Mars and Sirius, and I'm going to move over into the north. I'm going to swing the view to the north, and back out a little bit, and put some sticks in here so that we can see some things. This is the time of the year when it's very easy to see the Big Dipper. If you look to where the north is, and you look to almost overhead, you can see the Big Dipper right here. It's upside down. There are the four stars of the bowl and the three stars of the handle. Uh, they call it the dipper. Think of it as a, as a scoop with a big uh, cup on the end of it, like a ladle. Now, right now, the big dipper is upside down. Astronomers uh, uh, have known about this for a long time. The big dipper is actually part of a larger constellation. You see the, the figures here. That, are, uh, that form a bear in the sky. Let's see if we can make the bear appear. This is the big bear, Ursa Major. And he too, like the Dipper, is, is upside down in the sky right now. So the Big Dipper is not a constellation. It's part of a constellation. It's what astronomers call an asterism, which is any obvious, easy to recognize pattern. The belt stars of Orion, that's another asterism. And so right now, the Big Dipper is upside down. Farmers have this sort of saying that the Big Dipper is upside down as if dumping rain on all the, on the crops and making everything green. All right, so the Big Dipper is these very obvious seven stars. And you know the Big Dipper played a very important role in uh, American history that you might not realize. It's been recognized uh, as, as a, you know, a special pattern for a very, very long time. And during the days of slavery in the, United, in the United States, the slaves were largely illiterate and they, they spoke to each other sort of in code and they had a lot of songs. And one of them was to follow the drinking gourd. That was the name of a song that they would sing to each other. And it was actually code because the drinking gourd was none other than the Big Dipper. And so because the Big Dipper is always in the Northern part of the sky, if the slaves followed the drinking gourd, if they traveled at night, if they were escaping from their plantation and trying to find their way north to safety in the northern states, as long as they kept the, the Big Dipper in front of them, they knew that they were traveling north, more or less. Well, there's one other thing about the Big Dipper that I want to show you right now. And that is, if you take these two stars that are uh, on the, on the left-hand side of the lip and you follow them down, draw an imaginary line and follow them down, you'll come to this star. It's a pretty innocuous medium bright star, but it is very well known all the world over because this is Polaris, the North Star. And Polaris has a very special location because you can see it's directly above the Northern horizon. And so that's very helpful if you're trying to find your directions at night. But more than that, if you take that fist and you extend it out and you measure how many fists above the horizon the North Star of Polaris is, that is a rough approximation. Those fists times 10 will give you a number of degrees that's very close to your latitude. So for me here in Boston, the Polaris is about four, four and a half fists above the Northern horizon. It's always there in the same spot. And wouldn't you know it, the latitude of Boston is about 42, 43 degrees. So mariners made good use of this knowledge. Not only did Polaris tell them where the direction toward north was, but it also gave them a rough idea of where they are on the, uh, on the Earth's surface in terms of their latitude. So that's the Big and Little Dipper. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, there's one other thing I wanna show you with regard to the Big Dipper, and that is if you follow its handle here, three stars in the handle. You know, this is part of, this is the tail of the big bear. Bears don't have long tails, but this is mythology. So anything is possible. If you follow those three stars, they will lead you to a very bright star in the Northeast called Arcturus. Arcturus is an ancient name meaning uh, guardian of the bear. And so it's not surprising then that Arcturus is somewhere in the sky near the big bear of, of uh, of uh, Ursa, uh, Ursa Major. 
There's one other bright star in this part of the sky I want to point out, and that is over to the left of the bear between the Big Dipper and Venus, and that is Capella. Now, Capella is an interesting star. I can click on it here in Stellarium. By the way, this, this program, I'll mention it again at the end, is called Stellarium. That's the word stellar, and then I-U-M at the end of it. It's a great program. It's free. You can download it to your your phone or to your laptop, and it gives you all kinds of great information. I find it very intuitive to use. Uh, I used to teach at a private school, and all the fifth graders used it on their uh, their own computers and devices. And if a fifth grader can use it, then you probably can too. If I click on Capella, it tells me a lot of information about it. But in particular, it tells me that it's 43 light years away. So the light we're seeing from Capella right now left Capella in 1980, right? 1980 was, you know, the, the Hubble Space Telescope hadn't been launched yet. And the space, uh, the space shuttle was just getting started. Uh, so the other thing it tells us is that th this is what astronomers call a type G star. Now, what that means is that Capella is a star that's very much like the sun. And so it's, uh, I think it's also roughly the same brightness. Uh, distance it's not telling me what the magnitude what the uh, absolute magnitude is um so if 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 we got far enough from away from our sun in space the sun would get smaller and fainter and eventually take on a point of light in the sky and it would look like very much like capella okay i've been talking a lot about these stars of winter we're going to swing our view over to the eastern part of the sky. So here's the west. This is where the sun sets. Watch where the sun sets. And then after it gets dark, turn around and face in the other direction for the east. There's Arcturus in the east. And we have a bunch of constellations here that are rising up in the east. And these, to me, are the are sort of the quintessential um, um, constellations of the springtime sky. And one in particular is right here. This one right here that we're going to zoom on, this is Leo, Leo the lion. Very distinctive pattern of stars. You can see his head is here on the right, his, his paws. He's got a kind of boxy body and his tail is going off to the left here. What's interesting about Leo is that uh, uh, it, uh, it's, it's generally easy to find even if you have a lot of light pollution in the sky because what you'll be able to recognize is this pattern of stars right here with at its bottom is Regulus, the brightest star in Leo, which is uh, Latin for little king. And so, you know, the lions are king of the beasts and so it all kind of fits mythologically. But this shape here uh, with this sort of arc of stars going down here, it's kind of like a backward question mark uh, in the sky. And if you can see the stars of Leo, then you've got a pretty dark sky on, uh, on your hands and, and you should be happy with that. You should happy, be happy that you have that many stars. So here's Leo again. And I'm gonna back out here and I'm gonna show you there's a bunch of constellations here that have names that are probably familiar to you. Here's Virgo, the maiden. You can see her here. She's kind of stretched out with her head on the left. Uh, I'm sorry, her head on the right toward Leo and her feet over, uh, over in the east near uh, about to set. There's Cancer, the Crab, the Twins of Gemini. There is uh, Taurus, the Bull over here. These are all constellations of the Zodiac. These are the constellations that the sun moves through over the course of a year. And so uh, right now, these stars are, are uh, these constellations are the ones that are high up. Uh, Orion, for example, is not part of the Zodiac, but all of these are. So the these constellations of the zodiac are well known to us because we all have a sun sign. You know, it's it's the sign, uh, the astrological sign that that uh, we are associated with our birth date. The interesting thing is that um, these sun signs and the constellations that are associated with them are sort of opposite what you can see in the sky. So, for example, I'm an Aquarius. I was born in February, and you would think that during February, I ought to be able to see Aquarius. Nope, because that's the month that the sun is in Aquarius. If I want to see Aquarius, I got to wait like four or six months later, and then it'll be well-placed in the sky. That's a little bit about, uh, about the zodiac. 
We're, that is not something I spend a lot of time with, but it, it's interesting nonetheless. Okay, I'm gonna leave you with one more thing. Right at the end of International Dark Sky Week, there will be an event, this, I, there will be an event in the sky called the, uh, the, the Lyrid Meteor Shower, the April Lyrids, and here they are, this will be on the 22nd, so I'm going to click forward to the very end of International Dark Sky Week. It's around 8, 9 o'clock at night. Uh, these, are, are, um, these, are, these are meteors that appear to be coming from the constellation Lyra, which is why we call them this name. Here is the constellation Lyra. Here it's the Lyre. And so these Lyra meteors are called that because they appear to be radiating from that point in the sky. Usually this is a pretty weak shower. Uh, you might see one every 10 minutes or so if the sky is really good and dark. But unfortunately, as you'll see, I've moved the date up to the 23rd here. By the 23rd, uh, there is a, there is a, um, the moon has reappeared in the sky and it will, it will create some light, certainly light pollution will make the Lyrids a little bit more difficult to see than you otherwise would. So I'm gonna leave you with that. I'm gonna do one more thing here before we close, which is, I'm gonna show you the whole sky again, put north at the top, south at the bottom. And I'm gonna just, I'm gonna let the sky kind of rock on as it goes through the night. And you'll see what would happen, how the sky would change over the course of the night. Uh, if you just stay, were to stay up all night here, you can see all of the constellations moving from east to west. Orion is disappearing in the west. Um, new constellations are rising in the east. There's Lyra, the constellations of Cygnus, the Milky Way. If you wanted to see it at this time of year, you'd have to get up before dawn to see it. And then as, as uh, night gets, gets farther along, all, a whole new set of constellations that I associate with summer show up and then the sun rises and we have to start all over again. I'm gonna stop it there and I wanna, oops, oh, stop, 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 stop. There you go, there we go. Uh, I wanna thank you all for watching this. I hope it's, it's been fun for you. Uh, you know, I wanna mention again, the name of this program is Stellarium dot org s t e l l a r i u m dot org it's a free program you can download it another way you can do this is you can go to uh, the website of sky and telescope that is sky and telescope dot org and click on the link to an interactive star chart it's up near the upper right and there you can dial in a, a, a night sky for your location for any date any time and you can even get a printout of that that you can take outside with you so I do hope you get a chance to go outside during International Dark Sky Week. Those stars are always there waiting for you, even if you're ignoring them. And this is the week that you want to pay some special attention to them and appreciate the starry skies that we've got above us. No matter how bad or good our light pollution situation is, stars are there. You just need to go up and look up, go outside and look up. Thanks again for watching. I'm Kelly Beattie for the International Dark Sky Association. Clear skies to you all. All right, thank you everyone so much for tuning in to our Friday night No Lights event. And a huge thank you to Kelly and Sam Yukta for sharing their incredible knowledge of the night sky with all of us. I did pop in the chat earlier a scavenger hunt link. So if you want to take what you learned today and go outside this evening and look up and try to find some cool stuff in the night sky, please do so and please let us know how it goes share it on social media tag us hashtag idsw 2023 hashtag discover the night and we're so happy to have celebrated international dark sky week with all of you around the world it's been an amazing week we've had so many incredible events happening on every corner of the globe so just a huge thank you to everyone for the support for dark skies it's been incredibly fulfilling and inspiring to see everyone's efforts and everyone's excitement about this. I've had so much fun. I hope you all have as well. And one final thing, I do just want to encourage everyone, if you have not already or you're not already a part of it, 
please join IDA's Advocate Network to continue the conversation with us, to continue to stay involved. It takes probably less than 30 seconds to fill in your information on that link that I just shared there. And we would love to have you join us and continue in this fight to protect the night. Uh, we hold monthly advocate action trainings on actionable things you can do in your community to bring back the night and reduce light pollution. Uh, the next one is coming up very quickly, uh, the first Thursday of May, and we'll be joined by James Lowenthal, who will teach us how, now that we've gotten Dark Sky Week proclamations, how we can work on adopting the five principles as a resolution in our communities, which is a great next step after making those connections with your local officials. So please join in order to get those invitations. We also have an online community forum where you can chat with other Dark Sky Advocates, chat with IDA staff, uh, share your questions, your thoughts, your successes, cool articles you read. It's just a great way to really feel connected to this truly global movement of Dark Sky conservation around the world. So happy International Dark Sky Week. There are still one more day. I hope you're all celebrating. Continue to share on social media. Continue to look up and appreciate the night sky. And a huge thank you again to Sam, Kelly, and to everyone out there joining us today. We truly appreciate it. And keep looking up. Thanks so much.